Hi guys, I'm Johnny from Cinedy and in this video I paired the Panasonic Lumix S52 camera with the Tokina 25 to 75 mm cinema zoom lens. Tokina was kind enough to lend us the lens so that we can review it together with the new camera and my aim was to film a mini documentary to see how well or not they work together in the field. Whatever conclusion I'm going to come up with, there is no substitute for watching the results and judging the footage for yourself. So without any further ado, here's what I filmed together with Dr. Ludovic Ferrier, who is a geologist and curator of the Meteorite and Impact Date collections at the Natural History Museum in Vienna. Let's watch the film first and I'll be back with some notes right after. I'm showing here at the Natural History Museum Vienna 1,100 meteorites. Nowhere else in the world so many of these alien rocks can be seen. We are now in the Meteorite Hall. It's the world's largest exhibition of meteorites. This one that we have there fell down in 1751 in Croatia and was the first meteorite from the Austrian Emperor collection. And we are continuing to add things in the collection, new samples, because every single day some of this extraterrestrial material is falling on Earth. And usually it's like quite a big phenomena, it's like a very big shooting star. We call it a meteor, a fireball, and if a rock made it to the surface, it's like a hunt. Most of these meteorites that uh, we have in collection, they come from the asteroid belt. A lot of asteroids are located between uh, Mars and Jupiter, and they are orbiting there, but sometimes they orbit across the Earth and it makes birth to a meteorite. This is a meteorite that fell down a few years ago, and like most meteorites, it's 4.56 billion years old. They are the oldest rocks we can find on Earth. They all look black because of their atmospheric entry and melting, but inside really is each one have a single story, it's like a piece of a puzzle, and each one can unlock really uh, amazing things. A few years back, I tried to buy a piece of the moon, and in this small part of this lunar meteorite, I found a new mineral, totally unknown on Earth, in fact, and we found out that this is abundant in the mantle of the Earth. It's why, by looking at meteorites that come from far away, we understand things that take place on our own planet. This is a meteorite from the moon. This rock was part of the moon at some point. It was ejected from the moon and it made its journey for thousands of years in the solar system. We have cut it in two to look at the inside of the stones and we investigate it to understand what story it's in there. We have meteorites that are really unique that come from the moon, but even more exciting, so to say, we have meteorites from Mars, meaning that these rocks were formed on Mars, but during a big impact collision, they have been ejected from the planet. These rocks are the only piece of Mars that so far we can investigate in the laboratory. We have been on Mars, we are on Mars with rovers and so on, but we never collected something from Mars back to Earth. And it's why these meteorites are so unique. We have three piece from Mars to investigate in the laboratory to understand what Mars is made of and the past history of Mars. And by looking at Mars, sometimes we can better understand what is going on or what will be taking place on Earth. Today I'm a curator of this amazing collection. I'm a geologist by training and all started when I was like four or five years old. I was collecting rocks all around in my place, coming from the countryside in France. And one day I found in the field a rock that I believe to be a meteorite. It turned out it is not one, but this was kind of motivating me, pursuing me in this kind of direction. 
Well, it's, it's really my, my passion. It's a kind of a dream job that I have. But what is really exciting is to go in the field. And what makes this unique is that you are afterward the first one to find the evidence that a huge impact took place. But when you are back, is where the scientific work is really starting when you look at the rocks under the microscope. Meteorites on Earth, we know about a little bit more than 70,000 pieces that have been identified, that have a name and so on. In Austria, we have only eight, but it's quite amazing because uh, it's amazingly low, in fact. We would expect a bit more considering the size of the country. I would say a few tens, a few hundred years ago, much more people were witnessing such a thing because they were looking up in the sky. These days, people are looking at their mobile phone. They are not really paying too much attention on the nature that surrounds us. And there is many of these events that are just unnoticed. It's why it seems these days, a lot of these meteorite fall just are unnoticed and they are lying somewhere to be discovered. We are hunting for meteorites. We have camera networks that we are installing currently in Austria. With this camera, we can make triangulation. And based on this triangulation, we can estimate the area where a potential meteorite, like this one, will have fall down. This is what was seen from Vienna on the 24th of June. This we expect for such a bright fireball to find meteorite on the ground. Based on this and other record, we were able to calculate where potential meteorite made it. And it's really like looking for a needle in a really many, many square kilometers where it's very difficult. And what I do usually in this case, I prepare such a flyer that I, I give to the people to make them aware of what is happening, what was happening in their neighboring and to help me in the search. And I really hope that with all the effort, uh, putting cameras, making people aware about it, more meteorite will be found in the next decade. Thank you, Dr. Ferrier, for having me as your guest at the museum. And thank you, Julie, our editor, for editing this piece. So the Lumix S52 caused a bit of a stir in our industry and for a very good reason, as it is Panasonic's first phase detection autofocus camera. In short, Panasonic now has a camera system with an extremely capable autofocus functionality, and you can learn more about it by clicking on our Lumix S52 review link right here. So there is a lot of information on the new Panasonic S52 already out there. But I was curious to try and do something a bit more creative with the camera than just playing around with the autofocus system. As far as I'm concerned, this camera might be limited in specifications, but certainly not in what one can achieve with it. In the short film that you just watched, I paired the camera with the Tokina 25 to 75 mm T2.9 cinema zoom lens. Although this Super 35 lens is relatively new, it already has quite a few competitors. In saying that, next to its optical characteristics, the main advantages of this lens are its mechanical build quality and 36 mm image circle that covers both Super 35 next to selected larger image sensors. And this is where the Tokina lens and Lumix S52 both work well together. Let me explain to you how and why. So first thing first, the Tokina 25-75mm to 75 millimeter exists in a variety of five mounts, PL, Sony E, Micro Four Thirds, Nikon F, and Canon EF. The mount is interchangeable and I will touch this point a bit later. For this review, I used the EF version and connected it to the camera with the Sigma MC21 EF to L mount lens adapter. Now, for the camera, I chose to film on its most robust compression settings, meaning using 4 to 2, 10-bit, and long-op. 
These settings can be utilized in the maximum resolution of C4K. The Tokina is a Super 35 lens, but remember it can cover some selected larger sensors too. This is one of the reasons why I chose to film with the Lumix S5 II and in full frame mode. The camera can accommodate this lens when using C4K resolution in order to achieve nice image aesthetics. So practically speaking, what did I do in order to avoid some lens vignetting? On the camera itself, I set the framing guides on 239 to 1 aspect ratio, which alone helps with ignoring possible vignetting. Next, all I had to do is zoom in a bit to around 26 mm, and voila! Now I could safely use the lens on the Lumix S5 II full frame camera without fearing any vignetting issues. This cine lens is all manual, so you can imagine how easy it was for me to rely on the camera's ability to magnify focusing by punching in even when recording to assure focusing. Let me elaborate on the Tokina lens a bit more. It's built like a tank and weighs almost 2 kilos. The focus rotation is 300 degrees, a bit too much for a single operator, especially if you are not using a follow focus unit. Gears are all industry standard with 0.8 mode. Focus breathing is well controlled. The front filter diameter thread is 86 mm and in order to save on weight and space, I use the Velium Megrota variable ND filter instead of a matte box. And like many other lenses in its category, it has a power focal design, so zoom in for easy focusing and out for your desired frame. The minimum focus distance is 74 cm, not great, but can be expected. Chromatic aberration is definitely visible. Let me conclude my first impression I had with this lens by saying the following. I had two issues with this Tokina lens. The first is its overall sharpness, especially when being wide open. Personally, I think that the images are rather soft when filming on T2.9. I can definitely recommend closing the aperture ring and try working with T4 settings in order to overcome the lack of sharpness. The second is the absence of a metric lens version. I mean, you can get one, but this can be done by submitting a specific request to your dealer or Tokina. So out of the box, the lens will come with an imperial distance reading scale, making it difficult to work with in some countries. On a positive note, I like the flexibility of this lens offers in terms of focal length and the possibility of using it on some full frame cameras. It's really useful to be able to use a Super 35 lens on larger sensor cameras. The bokeh is very pleasant and on top of that it has a special aesthetic image quality to it because the lens is not that sharp, at least in my opinion. Last but not least, the lens mount can be swapped DIY, but Tokina recommends a lens service facility to perform the swap so they can properly shim, collimate the lens so the focal marks are accurate. When it comes to pricing, it will set you back for 4,999 USD. Now, depending on your filming needs and budget, this lens can certainly appeal to small production houses and independent filmmakers too. Now, in regards to the Lumix S5 II, Panasonic did a remarkable job with this entry-level camera. Actually, I'm not done testing it yet, so if you're interested, stay tuned for additional practical reviews. Thank you guys for watching and please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.